All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Tennis Channel Inside In on the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. Mitch Michaels from the Santa Monica studio. Twice a week we've been doing the show during the U.S. Open. Special occasion, a lot to talk about. Joining me now, Senior Editorial Director of Tennis.com, a New Yorker who's no stranger to the U.S. Open, especially this one with a lot of good insight covering the tournament. Ed McGrogan back on the podcast. Ed, welcome back. It's uh, bittersweet because we're at the end of the tournament, but another U.S. Open where there's an endless amount of drama to discuss. Yeah. Hey, good to have you back uh, or be back on here. Yeah, the Open, it always delivers. I mean, it really does. And most of the slams do, but um, for as long as the season is, and I've been the first one to say that, but the players will back it up too. Um, it doesn't usually lead to a U.S. Open that's full of surprises. Um, and I think this one is that case, even though there are some obvious new newcomers into the field but we can get into all that but it's it's been a it's gonna it's been a really strong second week for a lot of reasons and uh we're gonna see that pay off even more i think over the next couple days i think we can kind of start with um you know much to do about the conditions for a lot of different reasons and i bring this up because the players are bringing this it'd be one thing if it was just the fans or people on the outside saying this but when you know players jokingly or somewhat seriously say oh this conditions could in Medvedev's case, produce a fatality. You, know, you say it tongue in cheek, but you do discuss what we're talking about here. And Ed, I think the crux of this, and I wanted you to kind of expand on it, is you know they're closing the roof for preventative reasons. There's no air condition in there. It's essentially a sauna, a giant hot box in there. What are your thoughts on, I guess, the conditions that the players are having to battle with? I know this is supposed to be an outdoor tournament. It's played indoor because of preventative measures, but how the players are, you know, really testing their condition like something we've never seen before, dealing with the elements. Yeah, I, I totally get the um, it's an outdoor tournament position um, on this because and I think that's really more pronounced um, in week one where you have a lot of matches that are off of Ash or Armstrong. I, I guess the way I'm leaning it or leaning toward is I feel like if you get to week two, everything pretty much filters into Ash or Armstrong anyway. So there would be no. I guess to me, there's not as great a benefit of being indoors as compared to somebody who's, you know, really just laboring outside on like court seven in, you know, 95 degree heat in, you know, 138 degree court conditions or whatever insane metric mm -hmm. they, they determined. Um, so I think when, if, and this is, I mean, this is unusual to have it be this hot, this late in the tournament. Typically this is one of those segues from the summer to fall, but, I I think, and again, this might pay. This might go back to what I was saying about how long the year is. I think you need to just be smart here, from like honestly a humanity standpoint. Um, for the players, I mean, for the fans too. Like they're the ones who you've heard about setting records this U.S. Open. Um, I I think it's kind of just crazy if you're not going. If you have the ability to do to give some relief, and I get that this isn't going to be um, AC, like great conditions, but I, I don't have a problem with the, the roof being employed. And I think it probably should have been employed more this week, given how just stifling it's been down there. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I know we're nitpicking and there's no perfect solution. It's New York city in late August, early September. So you're going to have to deal with elements there, but look, this is an added test. And especially these men's best of five matches, you really have to have top flight conditioning and some fortune. I know the scheduling was another topic too. The golf Ostapenko match highlights that. And, you know, part of the game is, you know, dealing with these elements and dealing with these, you know, ups and downs of the tennis season. So there's been a lot to discuss there. The actual tennis, as we mentioned at the start, has been phenomenal. Um, talk of the town, talk of, you know, not just tennis fans, but casual sport fans. Ed, is this Ben Shelton story? Because he's into the semifinals of his essentially rookie season. I mean, this is his first pro season on tour. We talked earlier this week about the peaks and valleys he's had. He's gotten a quarterfinal in Aussie, now a semifinal or better at the U.S. Open to cover up a really lackluster rookie middle of the year campaign. But there is just so much to like about what this kid does. And, and maybe more importantly than that, how he's doing it. He's having so much fun out there. And I think that's what sticks with people that are tuning in for the first time or not really as dialed in as maybe me or you are. It's funny, when you set that uh, point up, I thought you were going to say Coco Goff, because you could say the same thing exactly for her, 
about being the talk of the town. And we'll get into her, I'm sure. And it just speaks to the, you know, really this coming out event for, um, you know, certainly U.S. centric tennis fans that they get Shelton as well. And among other Americans, obviously, who, who went deep here. But yeah, um, Shelton is really, um, I think to me, what is so interesting is that he takes out Tommy Paul and Francis Tiafo. Like the two of the three with Taylor Fritz players that, um, you know, mo- a lot of people had one of them going to the semis, had, you know, that's the consensus group of Americans who, if somebody's going to knock, they're going to end this 20 year drought of men's singles title winners at the majors, it was going to be one of them. And here comes Shelton, um, just a giant, um, giant personality, giant player, someone who like you can clearly see just embraces the moment. And I think mm-hmm. that's honestly the most impressive thing is 20 years old. Um, he's had hardly any big match experience. You know, he obviously did quarterfinals of, of the Australian. That was, you know, a serious surprise. And Chris Clary had a great point. He was, he said he was as surprised for Shelton making his run here as he did in Australia, which is kind of bizarre to think about on its face value because it's not like it'd be the first time, but his summer was so just yeah. ambivalent and there was no, no momentum at all. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just kind of shocking. Uh, but I guess when you do have a game like his um, that really no one else really has, that lefty serve. And I mean, what his, his stuff against Tiafo, I mean, it was beyond the serve. It was just, you know, some of the, some of the angles the guy has access to is on is crazy. Yeah. So yeah, I, and, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Just, you know, just to kind of get back to what you said, obviously Coco Goff deserves high praise and high marks, but you know, we're sports fans. I'm a prisoner of it too. We're looking at that new moment. She's been a veteran. She's been in these moments. She's having her breakthrough, but she has been around for a few years now, which mm-hmm. is kind of crazy to say. And this Shelton thing, because it's so sudden with no momentum, really does stand out. And yeah, that Tiafo match, I mean, it, the crazy thing was it wasn't a great serving day for him. He got broke a bunch. He double faulted away what we thought was a double serve. faulted a twice in the break. breaker, which was you, you thought for sure that was I mean, yeah. you, you could yeah. have given any you could have given any price on. Would Ben would Ben Shelton win the third set tiebreaker? And I still wouldn't have put anything on it after those two doubles. And it just, and then he hits basically the shot Djokovic hit against Federer down match point like eleven years ago. Um, just yeah. incredible. I really appreciate the youthful exuberance, and I think there's a a you know I call it what you want being able to relate to something. You see a twenty year old kid that's having fun out there that might not be listening to their father all the time. Who's their coach. I mean, that's a lot of us can relate to us th- that at that age. So I think with Shelton, just having fun, embracing the crowd, as you said, living for the moment, doing it in a way that's going to attract some fans and, you know, the lefty serving, and that's the technical side that doesn't want to get, that I don't want to get lost here that you bring up. The serve is great. The fact that he's a lefty, the fact that he can have access to angles other players don't have, and he's made real strides on his return game. He had a summer where he was one of the worst returners by percentage on the ATP tour. And he's starting to find something there. And I, I use the analogy a bunch that he's like clay. That's there's a lot of gifts there. There's a lot of special qualities. He just needs to be molded, but this is a very AI like race. It's happening a lot faster. than I think either you or I would have uh, predicted. No, I mean, he he's raw, but that almost doesn't matter. And I think part of this too, is I think ignorance is blessed when it comes to players like, like Shelton, for example, um, this is one of those kind of, you know, this is a, this is sort of a a juncture, a moment where, you know, we're going to follow Ben Shelton a lot closer from this point on, but at the same time, you get this feeling that you're watching something pretty special in, in in the present, uh, time. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I, I almost think it's, it's very hard to kind of predict where this goes down the road for him given the volatility you saw this year and just like he's, he will evolve as a player uh, in in a variety of ways. And um, I think it's just super curious how the tournament's already a wild success for him. He could Mm -hmm. lose, he could lose one, one and two to Djokovic and that would maintain itself. I, and I, I don't think, I do not think he will beat Djokovic. I would be, I would be surprised if it, um, 
I'd be shocked if it went five sets. Um, yeah. But it's, yeah, it, it's going to, it's just, it is one of those, the Ben Shelton U.S. Open. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just again, of all the Americans that got this far for him to do it, just, ha just kudos to him. We're going to get to the men's semis uh, in a little bit here, but uh, I did want to put a bow on it with the Tiafo side. A disappointing ending to the tournament. He makes the quarters, though, you know, one round less than he did a year before. He's going to, you know, exit the top 10. We'll see how long that is. Uh, the match itself was not great in the sense that he was able to get to the Shelton serve and still would not pull this one out. I think, you know, he's going to look at this as great as Ben Shelton is, and you know, we stand by all the points we made. I do believe, Ed, that Tiafo is going to look at this as a very big missed opportunity. Yeah, it's it was bizarre, kind of what you saw from from Francis. Um, there was this moment, uh, crazy enough, uh, right before first ball, where Tiafo's serving and he bounces the ball and it hits his shoe and it goes into the front court. This is like right before uh, the umpire calls play. And it was very for, foreboding, um, I guess, of Francis. He just never looked comfortable out there. You, Pretty much everybody said that after the fact, but you could just sense it there. You just didn't have that sort of spirit. Um, Steve Tegner, who wrote the match for us on tennis.com, he made a great point where you, you know, Tiafa was on his back foot because of Shelton's game, but was he also sort of retreating because – he just found himself against this other young exuberant player, like this other showman across the net. Like mm. that is the role that Tiafo has always occupied, particularly in New York. And he did so even going into the match. And it was just, it just never felt like he found himself. But the, the crazy part is he really should have been up two sets to one without question, um, given the way yeah. the tiebreaker played out. But, you know, that was, it, it, it I agree with you 100 percent that it's a missed opportunity um, and just a really just tough Grand Slam season for him. Like he's going to come away from this year after what he did last year, just thinking like this just didn't work the way we thought it was going to. So it it's definitely a tough end of the slam year for Francis. Certainly is. Uh, Tiafo still a lot of game, still very young, a lot of potential there, but Shelton gets by him, gets to the semis where he's going to meet Novak Djokovic, who again, you know, routinely dismantling Taylor Fritz eight. No, now on the career. And, you know, we can talk about Djokovic's level, Fritz's level, you know, the conditions were brutal as we know, but there's just something about Novak's ability Ed, to just, and I know we take it for granted. It's like the 40, 47th grand slam semifinal he's made, but to get through a draw to get to the semis to do exactly what he needs while we still look on the outside saying there's levels up like he's going to do exactly what he needs to get through managing his body managing his mental game no one has had more of a command on the tennis court and just their own innate ability to manage their body than Novak Djokovic I haven't done 47 tennis.com podcast in my career he's made 47 grand slam semifinals um <laughs> it's it's pretty staggering, obviously, the numbers. They always are with him. Um, I don't even, honestly, Fritz is almost irrespective to, like, that outcome of that match because that was all Novak. And it's – I've said this before, and we'll probably get to, you know, in a couple of days from now if, if the results kind of break the way I think they're going to, is Novak is still at the peak. He is legitimately still at his peak. Well, that's what um, I wanted to ask you because there's so much made about it. And, you know, would a 36 year old Djokovic beat a 26 year old Djokovic? And it's, it's, you know, it's a pointless argument in a lot of ways, but they're just the fact that we're having this discussion is crazy. Just the fact that we're able to even debate whether a guy pushing closer to 40 than he is to 30 can beat I, a guy I feel who like won number one in the world. I feel like, you know, <laughs> when we, when we talk about Novak, it's like, well, yeah, he's playing awesome. Um, he was, you know, Nobody real nobody can nobody can actually peak at 36 years old, especially considering what he did from essentially the whole decade that that we that just passed. But I, I I'm dead serious when I say that he is at his peak right now, and that peak honestly may have that that peak he's occupied. It may be a he may have been there in 2011. He may have been there in 2015, but he's still at that point. Um, you just watch the way he plays. You see what, you know, you see what the Alcaraz element of it has brought out in him. That's like this motivating mm -hmm. factor that I think is just another element of, of where we see him right now. But 
and you know, not to mention like he's back at the open for the first time in a few years, like the motivation for him is like, that's another part of it where that's probably at an all time high too. Like you would never suspect this from someone of his accomplishment, his renown, but it's all, it's all truthfully there. And, mm-hmm. um, it's yeah. really hard to even explain, but I, I I can just sense it. It's like an eye test thing for me is how I put it. Yeah, and that's a great point. Alcaraz reinvigorating Djokovic. The reason why the slam counts are the way they are, fully 100% believe this, is because those three guys pushed each other. If it mm-hmm. was just Federer, take your pick. If it was just Federer, if it was just Djokovic, if it was just Nadal, and a good good to great player underneath them, they're tapping out well before 20, in my opinion. Djokovic doesn't need to be doing this, but he sees a threat. He sees a new challenge, and it's giving him that extra motivation. And the winners is obviously us as tennis fans. But, you know, Novak's ability to continually evolve. His serve's better than it was 10 years ago. That's the biggest improvement I've seen. And he just knows how to win and grind out these matches. You know, the other side of the semifinal picture is going to be Alcaraz and Medvedev. Alcaraz beating Zverev Ed last night in a match where I wanted to start with just giving full marks to Zverev to being back in the top 10 now and getting through to this round because the center match was as brutal as a match as I can remember war, war conditions wise. I don't know that he would have beat or st- stood much of a serious threat chance to beat Alcaraz either way, but given what he went through, it just wasn't going to happen last night. He had no chance at all. You could see that right away. That I don't think that was a surprise the way that match turned out, but um it's that was that was uh, that wasn't a fair fight from the start um there there is you know that's that is one of the you know you you mentioned scheduling and stuff like that earlier like there is a bit of randomness when it comes to like where you can be scheduled how oppressive the temperature can be when you're playing etc how late you go into the night but the one thing you can control you know to a degree is like can you get off the court efficiently enough and like Sinner and Zverev, like obviously Sinner has a huge role in, in the way that turned out, but it's to me that match is A, a result of just like where Alcaraz is now in the packing order, but B, it's just this acu- this accumulating, um, you know, tournament for him of Alcaraz just being so efficient. He, he had this, when we look back at the draw back in the start, uh, Alcaraz's path to the semis was much more precarious than Djokovic's. It's really, he really hasn't had to run into too much, but, and part of this is just, you know, he handled Zverev as a champion you'd expect to and should given, yeah. given those, you know, the disparity in conditioning and all that. So, I mean, it's, it is another, you know, it, it's, it's a great tournament for Zverev. Like there's no doubt about that, but that, that was completely mm-hmm. a, not a fair fight. Yeah, I do think Zverev, the final point on him is that if he gets back to healthy, if he gets back to where he was, he has a game that could, I'll say, threaten the top players more than most on a good day. And if the players are a little off, I do think Zverev could be a a challenger. But the note I had on Alcaraz watching that match and beyond is that nothing about this kid is normal. Like Mm -hmm. how he handles himself at this age, the skills, the ability to come to the net and how he's mastered that tactic, which few people on tour at any age have and he's not even 21 yet and still doing it he is just a special talent who's you know added another component to his game and you said it perfectly it's how do he efficiently runs through players handles his business like a seasoned veteran it's very easy to think okay you're gonna have a letdown you're gonna have a bad day his bad days are still straight set wins and that's just remarkable at this age yeah, I, I mean, Carl, it's and, – and I think more people are seeing that with every passing week. I, I think that, you know, those who are really do follow the sport, they've come they've come across to this point about Alcaraz essentially being on the level of these greats, like, already. Um, it just, it's just – it's because of just the talent he has and the, the sort of the verve he has for the game. And it, it is – it is in a way sort of unlike – anything we could have expected or have seen. Um, it just, he does seem like he, he, I, I know a lot of the talk a little earlier this year was about like, he's this, he's this amalgamation of, of most of the big three. Like he does have a lot of those qualities, but again, we just talked about someone who like Ben Shelton, who, who is embracing the stage. Like that's another thing of Alcaraz too. Like you, he is at such a young age. Um, completely comfortable with 
the mantle of the number one player, the mantle of being the favorite. Um, mm-hmm. You can just tell that there is, there is that, you know, there's that joy about it that, and, and in a way that takes the pressure off of him, even though the pressure just continues to be ratcheted up. I mean, the crazy thing is like, I was thinking about this earlier. Um, if he wins this U S open, he probably already, you could make the case. Like, does he have a better, it, it, did his stats in his, career like equal andy murray already like at 20 years old you were gonna go there yeah like i mean and i know there's i know there's the gold medals i know there's a lot of master stuff but like if you put the two side by side like i think a lot of people would say like yeah on the power rankings like i would already put him career-wise above like andy murray which is insane to think about um but it, it it just it shows just how highly we are thinking of alcor as we continue to push the bar for him um, and against, you know, like you said, he gets Medvedev next. Um, certainly it's ch- like, certainly a challenge. I'm, I'm really glad, you know, they're going to get the, t- they get the, they get, the, you know, enough, enough rest, maybe at the most rest you could hope for. Obviously that's yeah. more Djokovic and, um, Shelton, but I, you know, I, I think we're going to see two very compelling Friday semifinals, but I expect you know, I expect the results to be Djokovic and Alvarez. You know, the Medvedev Rublev piece to this is interesting because those conditions were brutal too. And it, for, you know, looking at that match, I wrote down like, this is as close to a straight sets win as I can remember. What was it like eight points separated it? But that's Mm -hmm. again, when those two Russians play, it's kind of what you expect. Medvedev will just play bigger on the bigger points. And there's a dynamic to that relationship that we sometimes see with country mates when one has the upper hand, but I, you know, and, and I want to get to the semifinals later, but I do think that Medvedev has a level of comfort here that he might not anywhere else. And, you know, how he expresses it with interactions with the crowd and just interactions in his own mind. He just does enjoy playing here, whether that's conditions, whether that's the environment. I think regardless of what we see Friday night, you're going to get the best version of Medvedev at a venue like the U.S. Open. It's scary to think of seeing him as an underdog in New York because he will be a decide. You, you probably know the betting line already. I mean, Alcaraz has got to be like minus two fifty or something on. That would be my guess mm-hmm. on a match like that. Um, but like to see Medvedev with nothing to lose is a pretty scary thought. Um, yeah, like the so much is made of him in the crowd. Like that's it, that's another display of just his comfort here. He can clearly weather the conditions um, as well. So, um, and I'm sh- I'm guessing if it hasn't come out already, that's they would probably put that as the night match because they were the two, they were the second pair of semifinalists to to play. Mm-hmm. So, um, that's like a great stage for him to mm-hmm. embrace. Yeah. Which you, you know you're going to see something pretty pretty juicy there, one way or the other. No schedule yet officially, but I would agree with you there. And the line is minus three sixty. Alcaraz plus even higher. Medvedev. Yep. That's, well, okay. That's yep. about as big as a dog as you'll see Medvedev. Uh, Crazy. Really. Yeah. Think about that. Defending champ number three <laughs> seed minus. I mean, but that's what you see against Novak and Carlos in these <laughs> situations. Yep. More with Ed McGrogan here on Tennis Channel Inside In, talking U.S. Open as we reach the semifinal round. The women are set. They'll do battle tonight as you listen to this, and we, we get this out. Um, you got the final four of Alcaraz versus Muhova, Zabalenka versus Keys, or sorry, Coco versus Muhova. That'd be an interesting match, but we got, we've got Coco Goff versus Muhova. Goff coming into this as not the number one favorite, slightly below Sabalenka in the betting market, but the buzz and deservedly so with Iga out with how Coco has handled business Ed, that this is, I don't want to say her tournament to lose, but her opportunity to gain in the lack of a better term. The fact that this really feels like it could be her first major title. We know she's gotten to a final before, but she is handling this journey. She hasn't finished it yet, but she's handling this journey with a lot of poise, handling the weight of expectations, which isn't an easy thing, Ed, when everyone's saying you should win this tournament or get there. Coco's handled it well and has a favorable semi matchup and looks very, very primed to win that first major. Not number one in the rankings, but number one in in the the hearts and minds of most tournament watchers. Um, nothing has been too big for her. This has been a very, very impressive place for golf. I mean, she she had the opening night match where um, you know she's hitting balls in front of the Obamas. Like she's, mm-hmm. she's drawn the, she's drawing 
celebrities far and wide. She, um, like, again, just nothing has, has phased her really in this. And like a, a player who has some, you know, we, there's all, we, there's always talk about the forehand. There's always talk about, you know, some technical elements of her game that, that don't seem to play themselves out well over the highest crucibles of competition. But, you know, getting through a, a match like the Caroline Wozniacki match was a big deal. Like she, she destroys Ostapenko. Um, like everything that we talked about coming into the tournament for Coco Gauff and fans of hers have got to be just thrilled with seeing how it's played out over five rounds to this point. Um, it'll it, go ahead. No, I, I agree with that completely. It's almost like not who she's played but handling the different challenges and the different variables. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's what happens at these majors, especially what we've seen on the women's side is that the bracket will get messed up. You'll have different matchups, different circumstances, obviously playing in front of the Obamas and the celebrities is an added pressure for only the very mo best, most popular, but she has navigated different challenges. And I'd argue Ed hasn't even played her best tennis, which could bode well if she raises her game a level or two. Yeah. She's um th in, three of the five matches went three sets with her. Um, so yeah, there's definitely like, she's been tested, um, but has come through like really well in the end of all of them. Like third set of the Wozniacki match, six, one third set of the Mertens match, six, Oh, um, she's had, so like, it's been, it's been like, you know, typically if, if we see someone who kind of has really the pressure kind of getting to them, that's when you see that stuff shake out is in a third set, but she's been able to reset, I think, very well. That's That's been something in the past, like matches that have not gone Coco's way have really snowballed away from her from the beginning, but she's withstood a lot of that. Um, certainly the Brad Gilbert piece is, is a part of this. It's a great part of the story, um, but like this is really all on Coco for how she's just kind of out of nowhere like i didn't i did not see this coming after wimbledon um I, like Mer i know like american players do very well in the north american post you know wimby events here but i don't think mm -hmm. anybody could have predicted what we've seen out of her um to this point but um and semi against Muk i mean mokova is this i think this match will tell us a lot about coco actually because she's clearly going to be like everybody is like coco you this is like <laughs> get to the sub well, get to the final like yeah. th this is this should be like a an easy oh. quote unquote sign but it is most definitely not so that's a great point at the end there and we'll see what happens in the final but just for the semi-final match the general public might be saying this should be easy which i would argue look muhova is muhova is like become a legit top 10 player. Like she backed up and I just love that p piece of it. We saw it with Vondrasova as well. I love the fact that these finalists are in Vondrasova's case, major champions kept it going. Like they used that momentum to keep it going. And this is another run for her finals of Cincinnati semifinals of another major. And the way that she plays isn't, I guess the easiest. I do think Coco matches up well against her, but we know what the general public is going to say. You should mm -hmm. win this match easily. You should get to the final. So it's another test of pressure that she's handled so well uh the final could be different depending on what happens in the other side it's going to be it's going to be madison keys versus sabalenka and sabalenka and i and i was guilty of it too we talked about the hiccups so many times and the letdowns and you know before the major for sure and then even after the, the wimbledon and, and roland garros losses that she had but this is five straight major semifinals. this is you know obviously four this year seven and oh in her quarterfinal matchups this is an unbelievably consistent player. So say what you want about her and some of the letdowns, but she's as consistent as anyone's been, and they deserve a new number one when the rankings come out on Monday. Jesse Pagul and Andre Rulov need to start talking to um, Sabalenka on their quarterfinal records. That's um, that's crazy, that, that number there for her. Um, this is an awesome semifinal that we're going to get here. Um, you also mentioned about the, the yips with Sabalenka that she's overcome. This has been like these these semifinalists. It's like it's players that have had like really troubling uh, weaknesses, like golf forehand, Sabalenka serve, Madison Key is kind of like mentally just getting by it, um, and and they're here. So 
Um, Sabalenka versus Keys is like is just fascinating. Um, it's it's really hard to pick against either player right now. Like when I when I watch Keys play Pagula, and after that I said if if Keys somehow plays like that, there's no way she's not winning the title. Like the level that she was at in a in a match like that was outstanding. And then you get to throw her against. All right, well. She can play that. We're gonna put. We're gonna pit her against Arena Sabalenka, the number one player in the world in a couple of days, who hits the cover off the ball pretty much just as hard. So um, that one, I, I, you know, I, I think the crowd stuff can be overblown at times in Arthur Ashe Day, but I do think this is one where can the crowd play a big role in this for Maddie? Like, I think Sabalenka could still get rattled by that, even even though she's you know has she's seasoned she's probably seen it all but like this is a bit of a this would be a bit of a like a pro wrestling crowd if it got to that point like they really like yeah. and especially if coco wins her semi like they're gonna be dying for coco versus keys in the final so um maddie for her i do think she's also playing with a bit of house money here like I don't like, this is another kind of unexpected run for me. Like everybody knows what keys can bring. Like, I just don't think we saw this necessarily coming either. So um, Mm -hmm. pressure, pressure on this one is more on Sabalenka to me. And, you know, she, I'm sure she's going to answer that at call, but I'm just looking forward to that semifinal tremendously. I think even if Coco loses, you could see the, oh, well, we need yeah. at least one American in here crowd reaction. And uh, pro wrestling, you read my mind. I mean, this is what, like, if you were going to preview it, it's like maybe Goldberg, Brock Lesnar. Like, you know what you're going to get. There's not going to be much finessing the ball out here with these two playing. <laughs> Big meaty guys mashing meat, as Kazim <laughs> likes to say on the uh, Mass Man show. Um, it's a great podcast, by the way. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, they um this is this is going to be just power versus power. Like, that. it's as simple as that. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be real, a great display. Um, just, I, I just, I hope it's uh hope it delivers, you know, keys being back here six years after she made that run to the final, a lot has gone on. I would take your, you know, take one step further. I think she could have the highest ceiling left of any of these players, including Coco. And I think she does that too. Says a lot. Yep. It says a lot, but it also shows you what her a level is. We know that the problems in the baseline when. She's had bad days. She hasn't been able to steady the ship, and it's gone sideways fast. So if she brings her A-level, gets that crowd boost, it could be something. But we're at a stage with Sabalenka where she's just so rock solid now that it's tough to say that a player like Keys could beat her. I think this is going to be a great match. I think for Coco's side, getting back to her, if she t- handles business like we expect, who she plays in the final, it's going to be fascinating because if it is Coco versus Keys, the All-American Showdown, I do think Edward's still going to have that ex- expectation as a general public, that this is Coco's tournament, where I don't know necessarily. I think if we get Coco versus Sabalenka, it's the best final in terms of statistics, but there could be more variance in people's predictions. I wonder who, I mean, this is sort of projecting, but I wonder if, let's say Keys hypothetically wins, who would she rather get in the final, Goff or Mukova? Like, would she rather be... I see what you're doing, yeah. Like, would the vibes of, like playing an American again in the final beat. Like that was such a, that was a horrible final seven years ago against Sloan Stevens Uh, against Mukova. She would be this massive, you know, public favorite, like really high expectations too. I wonder who she would want to play if she, if she gets by that. This is my just thought prediction. I think she'd rather play Coco because the dynamic is different. Coco Mm -hmm. will enter that as a prohibitive favorite. The Sloan yep. Keys match, I believe Keys might have been the favorite. I'd have to look back and see, but it's also a friend of hers, which makes it very, very difficult to play someone that's your peer and your your friend versus, I know she's friends with Coco, but a generation below. So, yeah, look, the, any one of these finals, even if Muhova beats Coco and we get, you know, any any one of these combinations, I think is great. And unfortunately, I don't think you could have always said that with some of these majors, but the U.S. Open has what they want, I think, on the women's side. I think ESPN... Uh wouldn't wouldn't agree with you and every possible combination final okay, is great right. but um yes so from a purely <laughs> tennis point of view absolutely these are very worthy final four competitors um just it, it like i said at the beginning the the open has a way of delivering um just like pretty much all the slams typically do players get up for this it's no wonder like 
every other week of the 388 weeks of the year, it's the same sort of mm. mode and style, but you know, players do peak for this. And we're getting some like leg- we're getting some just career performances this week on the men's and women's side. And before we get to the men's semifinals analysis predictions, I just want to say, isn't it ironic that we've always talked about every year in these majors, it's the unseated women's draw semifinalist. Mm -hmm. This year we got it on the men's side. Now, again, it's Ben Shelton, who everyone's loving that he's here, but the the tables have turned in this regard. So we've got some good seated players into the semifinals on the women's side. The men's side is going to be Djokovic and Ben Shelton. We presume early in that one in the early match, but. Is there a path here, Ed, for, I'm not going to say when, because predicting Ben Shelton to be Djokovic would be stepping out on quite a limb, but for him to frustrate Novak, play tight, take a couple tie break, take it to tiebreakers, maybe even win a set. Is there a path there for the kid to do that? There's a path to frustration. I don't think there's a path to victory. I, I, I can't see that at all, but I, I remember, you know, Djokovic, like for all what he does, like he's, he still can show that like going on tilt mentality and matches. Like I, I remember even last, it was last year, two years ago um, when he played Brooksby at the open, like uh, when he's playing like these unconventional players that do have like the ability to kind of take the racket out of his hand in a way. Um, absolutely. Like if Shelton serves lights out and, you know, takes the first set and it like, could I see like him winning the first set seven, six, and then maybe kind of fading from there. I could see that, um, you know, in a perverse, in a like sort of a a strange way, like taking a set from Djokovic almost kind of seems to make him better, like play against you. So it's almost like, to me, like a lose, lose proposition for Shelton. But um, I, I, I think it's four sets at the at the very most, and I would I would honestly be surprised if it's if it's not straights. My uh my you know unbiased advice to American fans, Ben Shelton fans, tennis fans that maybe are rooting for the underdog, don't cheer Novak airs at all. Mm. It's just not going to go well for your player if because he he's looking for that spark. We saw it a little bit against Fritz even in that match where he is that player that. If you dog him, he will raise his level, take it personally. He's looking for that edge. And that's a good point. You, t- you take a set off Djokovic. The plan is that, you know, he goes into lockdown mode. He takes your legs. He, like the Brooksby match, just wears you down by the end of it. I go back to that Muhammad Ali, Chuck Webner fight where Webner knocked him down. And he just, that inspired the movie Rocky, celebrating the refs. Mm-hmm. Like, turn around, he's getting up and he's pissed. And mm-hmm. then it was one-way traffic from there. So, um, would love to see a close match. I think it's a measuring stick for a guy like Shelton to face the very best and see where he's at and where to aspire to get to. But I don't think we're going to be <laughs> picking Djokovic to lose this one. And then that would bring us to Alcaraz Medvedev, where I guess the the final question on this one, Ed, is do you see this as a much closer affair than the Wimbledon one-way traffic? Do you think the court conditions, the comfort can give Medvedev a puncher's chance in this one? Um, I think Medvedev has to play as aggressive as he's ever played. Um, it's like... Alcaraz is a player who can, if he wants to stay with Medvedev for super long rallies, which is kind of the, the currency Medvedev trades in, like, I don't think Alcaraz is a problem with that. Um, I I think, you know, I think you look at those two guys and Medvedev can do a lot of great things. He can serve well. He can deal with kind of anything that's thrown at him. Like, Alcaraz can clearly do that stuff, too. Um I I think this one all comes down to like the Medvedev mentality and execution in a way. I I feel like at this point, we know what we're getting from Carlos. Um, And I mean, the I think the ceiling of this match is we get this like five set classic. Um, I I don't see Alcaraz losing this at all. Um, But I mean, Medvedev is, a. will say this, Medvedev is the kind of like, we haven't seen Alcaraz rattled too often, but if there's any, if there's any player that could like really throw some junk at him and like, maybe we see some sort of, you know, just the, the, the moment gets like too crazy and just like off, off his game. Like Medvedev is, he's a disruptor in that regard. So mm-hmm. um, this one is really fascinating to me. I'm, I'm super excited to see this one. Um, you know, even mm-hmm. above of even of all the four semifinals, this one I'm looking forward to most of all, just because 
it could, I mean, this, this could be a dud too, honestly, but I, I think the ceiling is really high for this. So would you say the ceiling is like that U.S. Open final that Medvedev was in with Nadal, where it looks like yeah. it's one-way traffic, and all of a sudden he starts throwing some junk at him. Even Nadal was a little rattled, but again, Nadal figures it out late, plays the bigger points. I think that's fair. I, I would say it's probably a four set. I'm leaning towards the four set region where Medvedev will take a set off of him, but Alcaraz just, again, wears him down like he does. And that would give us Djokovic Alcaraz 5, another, another uh, iteration, third straight major appearance major face-off between these two. And I guess we can end with that. What would that mean for the rivalry and for the fact that the city of New York and the U.S. Open would get to see this in a final? I've got some stuff I'm going to keep my powder in for about the rivalry itself if that happens to materialize. But, um, I mean, it would be big for tennis. Period. It, would be, it would go way beyond New York. Like, the U.S. Open is a big element of it, but... I mean, if it does happen and you just look at the the sequence of events and their matches that have taken us to that have taken us to that point, um, really one of those like transcending the game type of deals because th- I think I think this stat is correct is have they played in the final in every event that they've both been entered in this year? I think that's because you think of the events Novak has missed with COVID or vaccination stuff early on. Alcaraz was out yeah, injured. Wow. So I think every event where they've both been entered, they've played. Um, not wow. necessarily in a final, but in the semis and Roland Garros. So um, just, you know, really amazing stuff if it did happen. Um, and I can't remember where I was going with this. But yeah, certainly something we can talk about um, if, it, if it happens to, to come around. I can't wait to see how this is all going to finish up. Uh, Ed McGrogan, this has been a blast. Thanks for coming on Tennis Channel Insight. And what else do we have as, uh, you know, the man running the ship at Tennis.com? What else can we expect on the website going forward this weekend and beyond? Yeah, a lot of a lot of really good stuff on the site. We did a lot of – I would encourage people to look at some of the bigger features we've did about – actually, a lot of these semifinalists that we wrote earlier that are more – that are more bigger picture, more evergreen pieces like – if you love Shelton's game, there's a, a really nice feature on kind of this crop of college players that have brought really a new dynamic to the pros with him leading the way. Um, Peter Bodo had a great story on Alcaraz, what he brings to tennis, um, like how he has just continued to change the game in kind of a, a new way at really all levels of, of ability, actually. Um, we'll be covering everything, you know, from, from Flushing Meadows very extensively. Um, and just, you know, that doesn't stop after the U.S. Open, obviously. So um, just definitely encourage you to come on, download the app. That's an important one, too. Um, live scores, um, stats, everything, and, like, uh, really dynamic order of plays. Uh, every, every tennis fan looking for order of plays that are actually correct, uh, we yeah. have it on tennis.com and on the app. So please download that. Check out tennis.com for everything, articles and podcasts. Also, a shameless plug there, a little Mick Foley cheap pop. But uh, Ed McGrogan, thanks for coming on Tennis Channel Insight In. Always a pleasure chatting tennis with you. All right, buddy. We'll talk soon.